All eyes on Detroit while we count down to the UAW strike deadline and the start of the North American International Auto Show. It's shaping up to be a wild week in the automotive world. COVID concerns increase as cases and hospitalizations spike. What's the best way to stay healthy this fall? And navigating changes in the complicated college admissions process. Today is Sunday, September 10th, 2023. This is Flashpoint. Good morning to you and welcome to Flashpoint. I'm Christy McDonald in for Devin Skillian. So glad that you are with me. While the deadline is getting closer, the UAW contract with Ford, GM and Stellantis is up as of Thursday at midnight and negotiations are playing out as media from around the world head into town next week for the North American International Auto Show. All counter offers are in and UAW head Sean Fain has used all sorts of language like insulting to describe them. The latest on the possible strike and the economic ripple effect for all of us. Plus the surge of COVID add on flu and RSV this fall. What we need to know about the latest mutations and vaccines for all. Dr. James Baker from the University of Michigan joins me for that. And then this is the stressful time of year when high school seniors are getting applications ready for college. You know, admissions have changed first with the Supreme Court ruling that limits how colleges consider race as a factor. But what about legacy considerations and more students using AI to write essays? We'll talk who gets in and why with journalist and author Jeff Salingo. Let's get to it. Flashpoint starts right now. Let's get to the very latest on negotiations between the UAW and GM Ford and Stellantis. Say hello to Local Ford Business Editor Rod Maloney. It's good to hello. have you here, Rod. <laughs> hello. And a business professor at Wayne State University, Merrick Masters. Merrick, it's good to have you on. It's a pleasure to be here. All right, let's go ahead and start with you, Rod. We know that the initial counter offers from mm -hmm. Ford, GM, and Stellantis mm -hmm. are in, and they are similar but varied a little bit in terms of percentages of right. raises. But now is where the micro negotiations Well, starts. this is where it gets started. I think one of the things, and Merrick will agree with me on this, that the old way of doing this was kind of a very sort of lumbering, last minute, not not a lot of emergent mm -hmm. uh, need. In other words, um, the president would go in and sit down with either the CEO or they would sit down with the, the, the chief negotiators, close the door, say, here, look, this is what we can do, this is what you can do, and then try and come out with something. Let, let them hash out the detail at the table and then hand off the contract. They would extend the deadline oftentimes for all three of the companies. Sean Fain has completely changed all of this. He said, look, no more of this stuff. I mean, look, his two predecessors went to federal prison. He said, no, 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 we're not, we're not playing in this game anymore. So we're not going to do pattern bargaining. We're going to put everybody in a deadline. You don't have a contract, we're going to walk. And so now you have this sort of emergency uh, sensibility about what they're doing. And so that's that I think is the big change. And so right now what you saw is that the when when Sean Fain came out with his video last week mm -hmm. on Ford's offer and he just dumped on it for a half hour or you know 20 minutes. He let everybody know that th th this isn't going to fly. We're not going to play this game. And and so now, as we are on this weekend, we've, we're starting to see, and I'm hearing sources close to the talk say, that there is activity. They are changing back and forth. They're exchanging offers now. And so they're getting somewhere. But the gulf between them is vast. I, I don't think that that's changed very much. So for all of the concern about emergency here, not much has changed in terms of whether the UAW is going to strike. Um, most people in the business think there's going to be at least one, if not all three, so we'll have to see. Them. Merrick, let me ask you this. When we look at some of the fine points, because we're looking at what a pay percentage increase would be, like 9%, 10%, 14%, but what are some of the other specifics really in this deal that stand out to you that could be groundbreaking? Well, I think groundbreaking in the sense that they may lead to an impasse. One, there's no COLA. Uh, two, the good news is, is that they have reduced the number of tiers for progression from eight to six the proposal, but the union would like none. Uh, so that's a gap between them. They also have a difference in terms of how they want to calculate the profit sharing, particularly with respect to Stellantis and General Motors. So there are differences across those things that need to be reconciled. <clears throat> and I, I, I think the big issue, the sticking point that's come up is going to be the amount that they're giving in wages. 
base wage, not lump sum payments, but base wage. They're at the high is 14%. Uh, they want 46%. And I think uh, Rod is right. They're, the UAW is treating the companies as if they're one. This is different from in the past. Mm -hmm. They're the industry-wide bargaining. They're saying, look, uh, you three companies, you can afford to do this, and we're going to get the same deal from all of you, and you're going to give us a lot more than what you've been willing to do so far in your offers. So the Gulf is wide. they got a lot of other territory to cover. I doubt that they can get there by September 14th. I think what's really interesting about, about this as well, Rod, is this is also playing out in the backdrop of the national media, international media, who's mm -hmm. going to be here for the North American International right. Auto Show, the timing of this. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we talk about negotiations when things get quiet. You know that mm -hmm. things are happening but mm -hmm. it doesn't seem that things have been quiet at all in terms of even the company coming out and taking out op-eds and saying this is what the deal mm -hmm. that we put out there is. It's been very vocal. Yeah, it's, it's a rather bizarre juxtaposition that's going to take place here. We're going to see this play out. I mean, you're, you're doing, you're raising big money for children's charities. Everybody's on board with that, including the UAW. The problem is, is that you get people out in, in ball gowns and tuxedos having a great time, and it's likely that at least some of the UAW are going to be out on the picket line. It, it, it's 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 a bad look, frankly, um, and I know that they're all going to want to like make this not be a big deal. But the UAW is going to press that, press it, you know, press, press its advantage as long as it can and make that look frankly bad and and yes this could get could get ugly yeah and it's about optics here Merrick but let me ask you this in terms of an economic um, impact across our area not just the auto workers who could be picketing but all of us in terms of economic impact what could you see if there is a strike well obviously the employers are going to be hard hit particularly in a longer strike suppliers are jeopardized particularly those that are in a cash pinch now and as a result of the workers losing money they're going to lose probably within a 10 day strike, something like that, 300, billion, $300 million in pay. Uh, and that's going to be less money that they have to spend on consumer items and businesses will feel that. So the ripple effect is pretty extreme that compounds over time. So we will feel it particularly in states like Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, where you have a high concentration of auto workers. I, t I asked you know, Rod talking about tone and words and the activity. What will you be specifically listening for in these next six days? Well, I'm going to listen for them not to talk publicly. I think when they're not talking publicly, they're probably making some progress. But I would go back to a point that Rod made that I think is really critical. The optics of having this auto show at this time are pretty bad. Uh, and <clears throat> if they do go out on strike and they go ahead with that show with all the glamour and everything else, you know, Sean Fain has basically said these companies are rich. They are led by rich executives that have gotten richer. And you have one of them in particular that he singled out and saying, you know, he's vacationing in a mansion in Mexico while we're negotiating hard at the table. This is something that fills right into his hand. Uh, in terms of what he's trying to do to convince people that they're entitled as a matter of right. It's not a matter of in his mind economic power, but it's a matter of right to a larger share of the profits. All right, Merrick Masters, Wayne State University business professor. It's good to have you. And I know, Rod, that you are going to be on this mm -hmm. for us. For It'll be a next. long week. It's uh, be a long, long month, week. probably. All right, good stuff. We know you'll <laughs> be on it. Well, coming up next, COVID numbers are up. We will talk about the best way to protect yourself, not only from COVID, but from flu and RSV this week winter and what it could cost you. That's next. Stay with me. Welcome back. COVID cases are on the rise again, and we are heading into fall with flu and RSV as well. There are a lot of questions about timing of the vaccines, the new COVID booster coming up by the end of the month. Joining me to talk through what we need to know is Dr. James Baker, the Ruth Dow Doan Professor of Immunology at the University of Michigan. Dr. Baker, it's good to see you. Thanks for being in with us. Good to see you again, and, and it's fall. It is fall, which brings a whole stew of things, but why don't we go ahead and, and look at COVID numbers first okay. and tell me where we stand what you think the season is going to be like for this fall? So I think COVID is the same that it's been for the past six months. I think that we're seeing slightly increased numbers, but we're seeing no evidence that the new viral isolates are worse than what we've seen before. Are they more contagious than we've seen before? 
You know, it's hard to tell. It doesn't appear that they're more contagious, but as we come together in the fall, we transmit it more effectively. So we're hearing more and more people. I've seen people mask up a little bit more out in public places, or we're hearing that family gatherings are being canceled because someone that comes down with COVID. When we think about that added in with flu and RSV, what will that mean for us in terms of everything out there? Well, I think it means a lot of confusion for people because we've got three different respiratory viruses that we have to deal with, and each one requires a little different handling. So what should we do in terms of, should we continue to test for COVID or when people start to feel like they have some kind of respiratory feeling, what, what is the next process, I guess? Yeah, I think, I think you can test for COVID. The COVID test kits still work very well. Even the ones that are outdated for the most part will still work. So I think that's a first step, an easy step to do. If you're ill and you don't really know if you have COVID or one of the other infections, I think it's best to go to your doctor and have them test for all three and find out if you've got a problem with RSV or flu or COVID. All right, so when we're talking about vaccines though, and people say, well, I always get the flu shot and now we're looking at RSV and then we have a potential, another COVID booster coming out. What series or in timing yes. should we be looking at? Yes. Uh, first off, I think it's important not to forget the flu. The flu is an incredibly important disease. We've been fortunate, partly because I think we were isolating with COVID, that we haven't had a flu outbreak. And in fact, the flu vaccine is still the standard vaccine we've had before. The one caveat is you don't have to be afraid of it if you're egg allergic. You can get it without any type of restriction. And you should do that probably in the next month to make sure that you're protected for the season with flu. So it's not too early to do it because sometimes no. we hear say, well, you want to wait so it can get you all through the season, but you're saying in the month of September, early October is the time. At, that would be perfect because you get at least six to eight months of coverage with that. Okay, and then what about COVID? Now we have a new booster that's going to be coming out. Yes, supposedly it's been approved this week and we'll be able to see it in the next week or two. The new booster is just, it's, it's totally the same as the other booster in terms of the content, except that it represents a new isolate of the virus. And by injecting this, we'll be able to get six to eight months of protection against infection with most of the people. And the people who really need this again, ask again are the elderly. You know, the people with lung and heart disease, the people that have had other types of issues, the people who are getting sick right now are not young people. The people who are getting sick are all over 65, pretty much. All right, what about our young people, though, and especially looking at our infants in, in the younger ages? Yeah, infants are a special issue right now, and infants are probably a bigger issue for RSV in terms of the impact on them than they are for the other infections. Okay, so let's look at RSV now and, and, and looking at that. What should we be thinking? So RSV is a disease mainly of young children and the elderly. And the elderly now have two options for vaccines. There's one from Pfizer and one from uh, GSK. They're a little bit different, but both of them protect very effectively. The children are a little different and, and we're now vaccinating mothers to protect newborns, but we also have a passive therapy we can give, which is an antibody that neutralizes the virus. So if you're concerned for your young child, you can get that antibody therapy and prophylactically protect them through the season. All right, but then I think people also think, okay, what is insurance going to cover and what is insurance not going to cover in this case? The, you know, the age old questions. They're all different too. Mm -hmm. That's the frustrating thing. Flu is almost universally covered. I mean, you shouldn't worry about that. COVID, there have been some concerns, but in fact, most of the insurance plans are covering it and it's totally covered on Medicare. So that's an important thing for over 65. The real kicker are these new RSV vaccines. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, they haven't been fully approved in terms of standard vaccine uh, regimens. So they're, they're covered by some of the programs, but if you look at the group that we really, really want to protect, the elderly, they're only covered by Medicare Part D. They aren't covered by the other yet, and they can cost $300. 
So it may be if you don't have risk factors for RSV, you want to wait six months or so until this vaccine's been fully approved and you'll get it without cost. You know, we're um, out of the health emergency in three and a half years since the COVID began. I mean, when you step back and you look at where we are now, what are kind of some of your thoughts? Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, Dr. Fauci said, I don't think the world will ever be the same. And, and I think he's wrong. I think the world has basically gone back to where it was. But if there's anything that remains, it's sort of an unease that people really thought that we had infectious diseases beaten. Mm -hmm. And what we're realizing now is that the world is, is a lot more complex than we thought, and we need to continue to try and protect ourselves and our children. Yeah, Dr. James Baker, thanks so much for joining me from the University of Michigan and help us sort through everything. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Christy. Okay. Well, coming up, the changing process of college admissions from the Supreme Court ruling to AI. Who gets in and why? My conversation with higher ed journalist and author Jeffrey Salingo. That's coming up next. Stay with us. Summers. Well, it's a time of year when high school seniors are starting to put together applications for college. It is a nerve wracking process with test scores, essays, short answers and more. We've even seen parents go to jail for trying to game the system. And now there's even more to consider for students with the Supreme Court ruling on racial and ethnic diversity, questions surrounding legacy and even AI being used on essays. Higher ed journalist and author Jeffrey Salingo joins me. He wrote the book Who Gets In and Why. Jeff, it's good to see you. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. You wrote a book where you embedded in three college admissions offices, and it was really fascinating. Each institution, of course, is different in what they look at and consider. But can you explain overall what the process is for schools in terms of it all being about the data when they form their class? Yeah, they're constantly looking, for example, how many men and women they have. They're looking at racial and ethnic diversity. They're looking at the number of majors. They're looking at the full pay uh, students, for example. And so what they're trying to figure out constantly is how that class is shaping up. And, you know, and one of the big impacts of the Supreme Court decision in June that they no longer could consider race is that they're not going to be able to look at a student's race throughout the process. So they're going to put students in the process at the beginning. They're going to send out these uh, acceptances or rejections at the end. And only then will they know how their class shapes up. How do you think that that is going to change consideration wide for students when they apply to colleges now? Well, I think some students are going to look for other ways that they could talk about their race and ethnicity, for example, in in essays and other ways that they can show because they're not going to be able to, for example, check a box like they have in the past or they're still going to be able to check a box, but the university is not going to have access to that information when they're reading the application. And so they're going to be looking for other ways and they should be looking for other ways where they could talk about their lived experiences in the application. I think what's really fascinating is we're seeing more and more schools going score optional. A lot of schools went to it during the pandemic and many of them are now hanging on to it. How do you think that that is going to be an, a, an impact on, on admissions? Well, we already have been seeing that for the last couple of years that basically what it has done is kind of open the floodgates to universities that uh, now no longer require a test score and students now say, oh, why not? I might as well apply to fill in the blank institution or even Harvard or Yale because they're not requiring a, a test score no matter what I have. And so what you've seen now is application numbers double, triple, quadruple at some of these places. Um, and now their extra low acceptance rates have even gone even lower. And so I think we're going to continue to see that. I think eventually these numbers will start to even out as students say, oh, Oh, even without a test score, I still can't get in. But we are seeing where I think we're going to continue to see this application inflation essentially at these colleges and universities. When you talk about applications, I think the dreaded thing is the essay. And I actually have a high school senior at home right now, and he is working on that college essay. We just saw in the New York Times, they did a story on AI writing an essay for Yale, Princeton and Harvard, and it did actually pretty well. What do you see the danger of students all of a sudden turning to AI and saying, hey, maybe it can help me out with my essay? And but really, AI is here to stay. So are they doing themselves a favor and showing the university that they can work with it? 
Well, I think what what they should do is it perhaps use AI as a kind of a draft, right? That they they they, they can edit. But I think it's going to be very clear to somebody reading it, um, or should be clear to somebody who has been reading these essays for years. You know what is kind of more personal and what is written by AI. Because at the end of the day, you know most of these are personal statements, and AI cannot replicate kind of the personal story of students. There seems to be an ongoing narrative, and we talk to you know parents right now saying it was much harder. It's harder now to get into to the universities than it was when I was applying to college back then. Is that truly accurate, or is it that it seems like people are going for big name schools or elite colleges that just keep getting the larger pool of applicants and they can't take everyone in? And that's it's the latter part that has exactly happened, right? So all of these more selective places have just become more selective because they haven't increased the size of their class, but yet they're getting more applications than ever before. And that is the difference from when today's essentially Gen X parents applied to college, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, they were applying to maybe fewer colleges and thus these colleges didn't have as many applications as they have today. Um, and again, the size of the class is the same as it was back in the 80s. And so when you get all these more, when you get all these applications, but you keep the size of your class essentially the same, of course it's going to be harder to get in. You know, it's one of those things that there's a place for everyone. If you can make it to a four-year university, you're going to be okay. But what would your advice be to parents and for students who are hand-wringing a bit about, about the places that they should be at or the marquee name universities? What would you advise people going through process right now that they should think about since all the changes have happened? Well, I think they really need to think about wh what is a good fit for them, uh, that there are a lot of universities beyond the top 20, beyond the top 30. What you're really looking for is a place that offers your major, where you feel like you're going to have a sense of belonging and purpose to what you do, where it's a good financial fit so that you're not putting your family or yourself deep into debt, right? There are tons of places that provide that engagement for students that students never look at. And so I always tell students, consider what you can consider in this process. This is the best time right now, early in the fall, to be looking at a wider range of schools. You may still end up applying to those top selective schools, but you really want to be looking at that wider range, at least at least right now. Hey, Jeff, are they going to be looking at legacy admissions in, in terms of seeing if that is fair or unfair for students? Because we know that a lot of universities will take that in consideration. Yeah, we're starting to see this now, even at the state level, where we're starting to see individual states think about having state laws that uh, that do not allow um, uh, the consideration of legacy status in admissions. And, and the one thing I worry about is that we may end up with a patchwork of laws. So we're going to have a couple of states outlaw uh, legacy admissions and others will allow it. Uh, and so now I think that's what the, one of the dangers in having it done at the state level. We may see federal legislation on this at some point. But for right now, I think most colleges are going to try to keep it unless they're told they can't. All right, Jeff Salingo, the author of Who Gets In and Why. It's a great book. Thanks so much for uh, helping us navigate the road. Really appreciate it. It was great to be here. Thank you very much. All right. And that is going to do it for me this Sunday morning. Thanks to everyone who joined me today on Flashpoint. Make sure you stay with us on ClickOnDetroit.com for the latest on the UAW negotiations and the North American International Auto Show next week. Devin will be back in the big chair next week. So for all of us at Local 4, I'm Christy McDonald. I'll see you next time. Take care.